If you haven't seen the nativity, you need to. It's an awesome depiction of the Christmas story. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. Today we're going to look at a man who never speaks a single word in the Scripture. I mean, if you're in the, the elementary plays, the Christmas nativity plays, you know, even the pigs and the cows get to do a noise. But this guy, this guy does not say anything. Not a single word is recorded from him in the Scripture. There's not a whole lot of information even about him. There's more said about the wise men and the shepherds than there are about this man named Joseph. The Gospel of Mark completely ignores him. Luke only mentions him in the context of the Christmas story in passing. The Gospel of John, there is one line. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. That's the only time he's mentioned in the Gospel of John. And yet here in the Gospel of Matthew, we get to understand kind of in an inside-out way, kind of in an in-between-the-lines way, who Joseph really was. His faith was a lot like ours. It was a faith that was not instant. It was a faith that was not without questions. His was a life of altered expectations, much like ours. Yet his response reveals the true meaning of what faith truly is. And in him, I think we find encouragement to trust God fully and wholly with our own lives. So let's look in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 18. The Gospel of Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus. The genealogy starts with Abraham, passes through David, comes all the way down to Joseph. It's different than the genealogy mentioned in Luke. That's a whole other series. It's a whole other sermon. But nonetheless, what we have here is a recorded context of how Joseph came about. And then let's look here in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. Here's Matthew's purpose. He's trying to describe how the birth of Jesus came about. But he's he's doing it from a different perspective than the other Gospels do. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. There's the first mention of this guy. Now let's stop here for a second. Because as you know, marriages were arranged back in that day. Parents would get together and they would decide who their sons and daughters would marry. And the older my daughter gets, the more I like that arrangement, by the way. I'm thinking about reinstituting it. So there would be a contract that would be made between parents, basically. And uh, there would be a one-year waiting period. Now, once the contract, though, was initiated, once this betrothal began, they were considered officially married. It was a time of planning and preparation. It was a time for the, the male, the husband to uh, earn money, to save up. It was a time for both of them to illustrate their purity to one another, to stay whole and to stay, to stay sexually pure. In fact, if the wife uh, became pregnant during that one-year time frame, by law she could be considered an adulterer and she could be stoned to death. This is how serious it was. They were considered to be married, and we might call it engaged, but really it's not engaged. It's more serious than that. And so the Bible is saying here that Before the news came about Jesus, Joseph and Mary had been arranged to be married. Let's continue on here. But before they came together, we know what that means, right? Before they engaged in sexual relations, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So here the news arrives. Mary is pregnant. Joseph doesn't understand. That's what we can read here in the scripture. That's what we can understand, that there is doubt in his mind about what has happened. But he, he still has compassion for this person who is his wife. And rather than publicly disgrace her, which he had by all rights the ability to do, He decided to instead divorce her quietly. Verse 20. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. So here's an angel, probably Gabriel. Gabriel was making a lot of rounds during all that. You read in the Gospel of Luke. I mean, the Christmas story is filled with angelic presence. And here the angel shows up. The angel showed up with uh, Zechariah. The angel showed up with the shepherds. The angel showed up with the wise men through dreams. The angel showed up um, um, uh, here with Joseph also. God was speaking. God was working. He was giving instructions through the angelic presence. And the angel says, you're to call his name Jesus. You're to name him Jesus. This is the Greek form of the name Jesus. Joshua, the Old Testament name Joshua, which literally means the Lord saves. That's to be his name. Verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Of course, this is from Isaiah 7. You say, well, I thought the angel just said to call him Jesus. And now the prophet is saying they shall call him Emmanuel. Well, if we read in the Old Testament, there were many nicknames for Messiah. (laughs) He was called many, many things in Isaiah 9. Let me read this for you, this, this wonderful prophecy about the birth of Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So, yes, many names. His earthly name, his name given to him, by the way, by his adoptive father, Joseph, was Jesus. Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke up, He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him, just as the angel had told him, he gave him the name Jesus. Now, you turn over to Luke's record of the birth of Jesus and you can fast forward a little bit. Luke contains a story here of Jesus and Mary and uh, his father Joseph going to the temple when Jesus was 12 years old. And in Luke chapter 3, it is the last mention of this man named Joseph in all the New Testament. The last time he is mentioned is when Jesus was 12 years old. And I want to read this passage for you because it says something, not only about Jesus, it says something here about Joseph. Luke 2, I'm sorry, Luke 2, verse 52 says this, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, simply meaning he came to age. It could also mean physically fit. He was a healthy boy. He grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. A whole, healthy, 12-year-old boy who had been raised by Joseph and Mary. And there in Luke 2, this is the very last time that Jesus' adoptive father is ever mentioned. It is supposed that Joseph died during the silent years of Jesus' life. After 12 years old, after this experience here in the temple, you fast forward all the way to 30 years old when Jesus began his public ministry, when he made known that he was the Messiah, and he began to preach and to heal at 30 years old. In between 12 and 30, we have no record of Jesus and his activity. Apart from this kind of statement that Jesus continued to grow, it is likely that Jesus continued in the profession of his father, which was a carpenter. So although Joseph probably died during those silent years of Jesus' life, we do know that he trained Jesus as an earthly father would. We do know that Jesus was trained as a carpenter. He's called the carpenter's son. We do know that he was trained spiritually in righteousness because of this experience in Luke 2 where he is brought to the temple at 12 years old in strict accordance with the Jewish law. We do know that Joseph and Mary had other children, at least three other children by their marriage. But Joseph kind of disappears off the screen. 
But I want to say to you that there's a lot in between these lines that we can learn from Joseph, particularly about faith. Because although Joseph had a, had a rocky start, Joseph pushed through the many questions he must have had. He pushed through the many doubts and struggles, eventually to trust in God and to do what the Lord wanted. This is what we learn from him about a questioning kind of faith. Let me share with you what I think Joseph went through. Some of this is speculation, but I think it's apparent. A questioning faith is a reality in our lives, first of all, when there are disappointing circumstances surrounding the need for faith. Disappointing circumstances. I mean, it is hard to have trust in God when your expectations are not met. We have a questioning faith when we go through not only disappointing circumstances, but difficult challenges. That what God is calling us to do is difficult because it means taking on more responsibility. We have our nice, little, well-organized, arranged lives that are comfortable and convenient. And God comes along and he challenges us to do something that requires faith. But also, I think we have a questioning faith when we have unpredictable consequences. Now, you think about this story with Joseph. I mean, there were a lot of blanks that were not filled in here. There were a lot of things not known about the future. No real future predictions were here. No true outcomes. The angel came and told Joseph what to do. And through faith, Joseph eventually did it. Now, how do we push through questioning types of faith? And again, say if you're a doubter, if you're struggling with trusting God in some area, boy, Joseph's story is for you. Joseph's story is for me. Now, how do we push through the questioning kind of faith to resolving the question so we eventually go on and we trust God? Well, again, I think he gives us some examples of what to do. I would say the first thing that helps us resolve the question of trust and faith in our lives, the first thing is this. Sensitivity to others will often push us to Trust God with what he wants us to do. You know, what do you mean by that? Well, think about this for a moment. Verse 19, it says that Joseph had in mind to divorce her quietly. Well, here's this situation that's been thrust upon Joseph. He didn't ask for, <laughs> he didn't ask for this. He had things all worked out. He was going to marry Mary. They were going to have children. They were going to be a good Jewish family. All those kinds of things. Though righteous, as the Bible says he was, and notice the ordering of this, before the angel came to him, Joseph, the Bible says, was righteous. He wasn't righteous after the angel came to him. He was righteous, so he was going to put Mary away quietly through a divorce. And then the angel came to him and said, don't do that. So here's a man, though righteous, would not be considered righteous if he took on God's challenge of faith. He would have shame. He would have a cloud of humiliation. He would walk through the streets of Nazareth and people would talk silently about he and Mary because she had what would be called an illegitimate child. His reputation, maybe even his business as a carpenter would be hurt. It was likely that Jesus was always, as he was growing up, considered to be illegitimate. It was likely that stories were told about Mary and about Jesus' birth. For those who did not believe, who did not understand. And I tell you, this speaks volumes about Joseph. Because what you see in him is a resolution to his questioning faith because he moved into compassion for another person. Compassion. A compassion that called forth sacrifice from him. A sensitivity to another person where he responded instead for their best interest rather than than his own. That's a wonderful example for us. You know, more, more than our actions, our reactions really do define our character and our faith, don't they? I read this week about three things that 
reveal the character of a man in the way that he handles these three things. One is bad traffic, which means I'm in trouble. Two is lost luggage. And three is tangled up Christmas lights. Our reactions, our responses really do dictate our character. They reveal who we are because we have to respond to this spontaneous in the instant. Our normal reaction, I think my normal reaction here would have been, how will this affect me? Joseph's reaction was, how will this affect Mary? That's ultimately what made the decision for him. So in resolving what to do, you you say, okay, I'm questioning with faith, faith in God right now. I'm questioning, trusting God. I think what we learn from Joseph's story is real simple. We have to look beyond ourselves to others and what the needs of others are in our life. What are the needs of people around us in our world? How will this affect them? What do others need in my life? And once you answer that question, that just might help you resolve what you should do in faith. Second thing is this. You see, sensitivity to others kind of resolves that issue of faith and trust. The second thing I think resolves it is the set of current instructions that we receive from God. The current revelation that we have from God. What He has revealed to us in the present tense is that thing that will eventually help us to resolve what we should do and when we should do it. You look in verses 20 and 21. The angel says to Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Don't be afraid to do that. That was the exact thing that he was afraid of. And so Joseph did not have a clear understanding of what the future was, but he did have a set of present tense instructions that allowed him to mobilize, that allowed him to move forward in faith and trust and eventually do what God wanted. It is difficult to trust God in these types of situations. Put yourself in Joseph's situation. It is difficult to trust God when you've already made plans. You've got the strategy already in place. It's difficult to trust God when you're emotionally involved with the problems. I mean, this is marriage. This is love. This is life. This is not a small matter. It's difficult to trust God when there are high stakes involved. This is not a minor decision. It's difficult to trust God when God's plan doesn't make sense. This was counterintuitive. This is not the way a normal Jewish couple would handle their lives. It's difficult to trust God when other people just won't or don't understand, which was true for them. It's difficult to trust God when God is telling us one thing and other people are telling us other things and we're going to be questioned by them about what to do. So he didn't know a lot, but that's not the point here. He didn't have a prediction of the future. He didn't have the ability to control all these outcomes. But what he had was a clear set of instructions that in the present tense provided a context for which him to take a step of faith. And people say, well, I just don't know if God wants me to do that. I say, well, okay. Well, that's why it's called faith. It's not called knowing. It's called faith. So if you don't know that God wants you to do that, then what do you know? Because the truth is, is that God has revealed himself to us in the present tense. He's allowed us to know some things, though we may not know all things, and certainly those things that are in the future we may not know. But we do know some things presently. Let me just make a, a, a very unspiritual statement. Faith is rarely free from doubt. You just can't provide too many examples from the Bible where those who ultimately had faith and trust in God were not plagued in some degree in the early stages by some kinds of fear and doubts. They were present. It stops being faith, though, 
when we allow those doubts to control us, when we allow those fears to immobilize us, that's when it's not faith. In fact, I would say that faith and some degree of doubt and questioning really go hand in hand. It's the process of faith. Paralyzing doubt. Debilitating fear, though, think about this, is often birthed in a future orientation. Fear and doubt is in a mind that is obsessed with the future. Faith, scripturally, biblically, is always, though, a present tense choice of making a decision based upon the information that I do know about God. It's like the old preacher said. He said, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Confidence in God's work in our past, the present tense instructions He has given us in the present will allow us to eventually end up where God wants us in the future. So people say, well, I don't know about the future. I say, well, okay, well, do today what you know God has told you to do. If you will do today what you know God wants from you, Tomorrow morning you wake up and you do the same thing. And the next morning you wake up and you do the same thing. And the next morning you wake up and you do the same thing. And eventually this takes you on a path to arrive where God ultimately wants you. But all of that is without an understanding of the future. That's faith. In other words, when you and I concern ourselves too much with the future, doubt, fear, Things get all jumbled up and complex and doesn't make sense. But when I focus on today and to be faithful with what I know God has told me today, that's empowering. And I imagine that's exactly what Joseph was feeling. I don't know about all this, but I cannot deny God's instructions to me presently. Do not fear to take Mary home as your wife. Which leads to the last thing. Sensitivity to others, current instructions from God. And the last thing is a desire to obey. As we focus on others' needs, as we act upon the current present tense knowledge of God and His will for our lives, and we have a desire to obey in our hearts, these will ultimately resolve the questioning of our faith and trust in God. This is what I mean. Verses 22 through 25, we really see Joseph's desire to obey, but you can narrow it down to a verse, verse 24, and you can narrow it down to two words in that verse. The two words are this, he did what the angel had told him to do. He did. (laughs) Here was a man who was righteous. Here was a man who had character. Here was a man who had obedience in his heart. He desired to do what the Lord wanted. And that moved him past debilitating fear and doubt to take a step of faith. See, Folks, the truth be told, the reason that you and I, the reason our faith is plagued with troubles and questions and complexities that keep us from trusting God, the reason that our faith is plagued with those kinds of things is often because we're just not willing to do what God wants us to do. We just don't want to do it. Obedience is the fuel to faith. The willingness to obey what God wants is what actualizes our faith. It moves beyond knowing about God to trusting in God. Those two things are remarkably different. Joseph grew up in a good Jewish home. He was a righteous Jewish person. He knew a lot about God. And now God had come his way to actualize his faith through obedience to his instructions. 
See, we'd rather question that part of God's will we don't know rather than do the part of God's will that we do know. Makes it easier that way, doesn't it? Get all tied up in knots about questions. and What does God want? And Oh, my. And I just think if we would have in our hearts to obey the part of God's will we know today, I think that might even be the gateway through which we will come to understand God's will for us in other ways. And the reason that God cannot trust us, the reason that God does not reveal himself to us in these greater ways, in these bigger questions of our life, oftentimes is because we haven't learned obedience in the first things, in the first principles. We haven't stopped to obey Christ in the small things. And yet we're asking for the big things. Well, here's Joseph. Here's a guy who said, you know what? I'm going to actually live my faith. And I'm going to act upon what I know God has told me to do. And I'm going to obey that. And eventually that will get me to where he wants. You see, many of us want to know God's will for our future. We want to know what God wants just so we can vote on it, just so we can consider it. I'm not so sure God reveals his will to those who just kind of want to think about it. But you go to Christ and you say, thy will be done. I'm willing. It actualizes your faith. And we come to know God in true ways. So we come to God with a desire to obey. And like Joseph, when we do that, our faith will be realized. And many of our questions about what to do will be resolved. Henry Blackaby wrote a book a while back. It was called Experiencing God. Some of you have been through the Experiencing God material. It's very good. It's powerful. It's really all about faith. And as the title implies, it's not knowing God. It's experiencing God. This is what he says about faith. He says, faith is a turning point or a fork in the road that demands you make a decision. You must decide what you believe about God. How you respond when you reach this point will determine whether you go on to be involved with God in something that's God-sized in only something He can do, or whether you will go on your way and miss what God has for your life. If I know one thing, I know that God desires to build faith. The Bible says in Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. How much of your life is lived in faith? No, I'm not talking about knowing God and reading the Bible, memorizing Scripture. How much of your life is lived by faith? How much of my life is lived by faith? It says, God, as I look around and I see the needs of people, God, as I understand currently what I know about you, and God, as I have a desire to obey you, I'm moving forward with what you want me to do. That's Joseph. And though, yes, he had a questioning faith, A faith that looks much like yours and mine, I would say. A questioning faith is often the rite of passage to authentic faith, to real faith. Doubters feel welcome. (laughs) We're all there. We've been there. Questioning is a part of the process. But ultimately what resolves those questions are the needs of others, what we know about Christ, and our desire to obey. We see those in Joseph's life. Here was a man who was called to sacrifice for the sake of others, primarily his wife. Here was a man who would be accused of sin that he had never committed. Here was a man who would walk through the streets with shame, 
here was a man who would give up his self-interest for the sake of others. Here was a man who would ultimately say, not my will, but thy will be done. Does that sound familiar? Like father, like son. The video clip we saw earlier, remember Joseph's statement? He said, I wonder if I'll ever be able to teach him anything. Well, I submit to you, he taught his son a lot. Taught his son a lot. Maybe, just maybe, some of the virtues that we see in Jesus were the result of a man who had questioning faith, but ultimately said, Thy will be done. And one day in the garden, maybe Jesus would look back upon his life and the context and the situation in which he grew up. And his questioning faith, Lord, if there's any way to let this cup pass for me, would be resolved just like his father's. A need for others. An understanding of of the current set of instructions that God had given him in an absolute desire to obey. That's how questions are resolved. And I just love Joseph. I just love the story of this man. Let's pray together.